Recording in progress. Okay, <clears throat> a very warm welcome to all of you both. Those of you who've turned up on this muggy, cold uh, Monday night, but also those of you on online, thank you for joining us uh, for this, which is a, one of a, a part of a series of three uh, debates on the role of the private sector as a shareholder in a renewed social contract. That's our partnership over the next year. Um, as Friends of Europe, uh, we're going to be working very hard, um, as we have done this year, as, as we do always, but next year in particular, because it's the year before uh, the elections and the, man and the new ma mandate of a European Commission from 2024. So our effort next year is all about trying to create 10 policy choices for a new social contract. And we're going to take a view about that, which is going to look at all aspects of society, civil society, private sector, industry, government, member state, European Commission, but really to think about, given where we've come from in terms of a pandemic, a financial crisis, a war that we didn't expect to have, an energy crisis, it seems that the new norm for leadership is to be prepared to manage crisis. It's a new norm to be prepared, uh, um, to have the resilience within a system that you run, to ensure that we're not like rabbits in front of headlights when another crisis comes. And you all know from the weather uh, that we're experiencing, um, it's likely that we're going to get more climate shocks next year, alongside the shocks of digitalization. Um, it can be an unfettered beast, a force for good, but it can also be a force for bad. So when you put all of that in the mix, what kind of uh, um, policy choices should the new mandate, the new commission parliament adopt? Especially when we think about that most of society during the pandemic was underwritten by taxpayers' money. Um, most of uh, society as we know it suddenly uh, was buoyed up by taxpayers' money. What does that say about the future roles of the different parts of those who make society? So the fundamental question we're asking um, as of today and over the next coming 12 months, 24 months, is that whose role is it to make sure we have a better society? Who takes the risks? Whose expectations are we meeting? How do we manage risk? And how do we make sure players are not suddenly brought in like they were, uh, i.e. the private sector when government got into a stushy over crisis, but to say, how do you take a planned, managed, risk-based approach to the future, which is going to be full of multiple, sequential, unpredictable shocks? That's not to give a bleak picture. I know it feels like that, but there's hope, because we know many people are doing good, but how do we make, how do we bake that in to the system? So today, the question is, how can business 
and uh, financial policy get us out of the crisis that we're in? Um, and to answer that question, we have the governor uh, of the Bank of Belgium. We have a vice president from MasterCard. We have the tax man from Europe. And we have a society representative that runs We Move Europe. So we've got a pretty 360 degree view of the question, and um, what we're hoping to do is um, ask them each to kind of make a response to a question that I'm going to pose them, and then I want to engage all of you, because uh, the brain is not just here, it's around the room, and I know that sounds kind of pretty fair and romantic, but I mean it. Uh, our debates are not meant, in, not meant to be simply a Q&A process, but what this debate, as a part of a series of three, is to generate a kind of, a, a kind of discussion that helps us think and formulate what kind of recommendations should we be making into the future next year as we develop this partnership further. So, there you go. Those of you who are on live stream, if you want to ask a question, uh, you know what to do. Press the participants uh, you know, icon. You know you can raise your hand there. Uh, but also, if you can stay muted for the moment, that would be helpful. But also make sure that your names uh, on the screen as well. Uh, that will be really helpful to me uh, so that I can uh, ensure that you're engaged in the discussion as well. All right, we've got an hour or so. Um, and, you know, let's, let's make a start. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Pierre. Pierre, um, thank you for being here with us. Um, you're a very busy man, as obviously mostly other, other people are too. But in this kind of um, lead up to the end of the year where you uh, have seen uh, a massive and significant shock in both uh, the, the role and significance of monetary and fiscal policy as a banker. Um, what, what do you make of the situation? What's your reflection? You're, a, you're an economist by background. Um, tell us whether what we are saying is just poppycock. You know, is there, is, you know, is our theory of change that we need to re-establish roles of public, private and voluntary sector organisations in a renewed social contract uh, worth having a go at? Uh, thank you for, for inviting me. It's a, it's a very interesting topic. Maybe I should start with where I'm coming from. And I, I've been trained as a public economist, so uh, and I'm going to cut corner because otherwise it's going to be, to be too long. But basically, uh, as a public economist, you're more or less trained to, uh, to think about market failures. So firms are there to produce the stuff. And you have to think about uh, how to regulate uh, markets so that you avoid market failures. You, you make sure you, to, uh, you, you, make sure, um, uh, you care about your distributive issues. The, the mic is not working, or? The button is on. But, yeah. Closer to the to your mouth. Closer, like that, doesn't seem to. OK, let's see. Um, this is terrible for the video. I'm just more concerned about how this is going to look on video. There you go. Oh, OK. So it had to be three. No, better. No. Oh. Is this better? No. 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 Sorry. Best okay. laid plan. It's blue. Yeah. It has to be blue. It was. <laughs> so yellow would not make it, green would not make it, but blue is okay. Uh, great. Um, so where am I coming from? Uh, I'm a public economist by training. So again, cutting corners. Uh, firms are there to produce the stuff. And we should look at the role of authorities, uh, market failures, uh, regulation. Um, and basically, um, redistributive issues, so that's where I'm coming from. So basically, what we expect firms to do is produce the stuff following the rules that have been set by authorities, and hopefully democratic ones. Uh, but of course, at the same time, we have to be good citizens. I mean, it's not enough to say, you know, I just abide by the rules and I don't care whether I, I follow principles. So we have to be good citizens at the same time, but there is a fine line between, you know, being good citizens and at some point losing focus or typically moving into communication because many firms pretend things and then when you look at what they are doing at the end of the day they are fo focusing on maximizing profits and producing the stuff mm -hmm. which is in a way what you expect from them and yet, then you have discussion about greenwashing because everybody would want firms to be green and the economy is brown so you're not going to have a green financial system and green firms if at the same time you don't have the regulation uh, forcing firms to go in the right direction. So that's a little bit where I'm coming from. 
So, you know, big role for the state, but still uh, firms should, should uh, place their part and be good citizens. So at the National Bank, I'm in a way the CEO of a company, not a private one, but a listed company. Um, and we are trying to do our part, so we are working on, on being greener. Uh, we, are, we have a diversity program. We are actually hosting now 30 refugees from Ukraine. I hosted for uh, three, sorry, for four months. Uh, so uh, I think it's, it's very important in, in these days where there is some mistrust of the elites and of institutions that we show that we are part of society, that we are not you know, too far away and looking from a distance. But at the same time, I think there are some limits to that and some risks to that. Um, so we've been working, for instance, on our values, but in a very polarized society, when you start working in your values, uh, dealing with diversity, dealing with many uh, issues that are uh, difficult issues in your society, you realize as uh, a CEO that in many cases you are confronted with situation and you know whichever de decision you are going to take, there are going to be people that don't agree with you. And it becomes quickly very political. So you can see, for instance, one example that comes to mind is Disney in Florida. Mm -hmm. They've been very vocal on some issues, on gender, for instance. Uh, and now they are, you know, in a way, being instrumentalized or being part of the political debate in Florida. And DeSantis is viewing his opposition to Disney to, so, you know, it, working on values and, and being present in the debate as a company, private company, talking about values, you know, you do it at your own risk, and at some point you might end up uh, feeling the heat because you, 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 you get part of the political debate. So, again, uh, a, a fine line that you need uh, between, you know, not, not giving the impression that you're completely out of society, but if you get too much into a polarized debate, uh, then you know you 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 probably are going to to suffer from uh, uh, this um, sometimes violent environment. On institutions, there is of course the role of institution. It's a bit the same problem: is that we are typically there to set the rules and not to be popular, uh, or to conduct monetary policy. Where independent monetary policy people, because you know people decided at some point that uh, being independent was important and on that front. Uh, but there was this feeling, and a lot of central banks have been working on that, that we needed to communicate more, that we needed, needed to be more accessible to, to the public, while we are dealing with extremely technical issues. And then there is this uh, dynamics that we see in many central banks where we are extending the scope of our mission. Hmm. We're dealing with climate, we are dealing with uh, some other issues. I'm personally of the opinion that our role uh, in terms of climate is, is, is not a big one. I'm um, very much in terms, you know, I believe in regulation and taxation uh, for, for climate. But, uh, but, but anyway, we've communicated on that. Uh, but then you have had some reaction, like Paul Tucker uh, in the UK, saying, you know, unelected power, what are, what are you doing there? And we do that on, on the basis of Article 3. It's a very long list. So should we care today that there is a problem of uh, energy security? So should we care about that or only about climate? but why climate and then not energy security? And of course, it would lead to very differ different investments and tilting of our portfolio. Um, and then you have, you have Summers that, that just basically said that we had become bookish central bankers and that we're dealing with stuff we should not be dealing with. And I should probably stop here because otherwise I will monopolize. <laughs> no, uh, it's, it's not a provocation. And it's quite, you're right, you know, Paul Tucker does his bit. And he's, I suppose people like Paul Tucker just re, are reading uh, the runes of what's happening. So, you know, you have a UK government, suddenly Liz Truss says trickle down economics. So she doesn't consult the banks. She decides that she's going to do something with the banks and they have to basically follow suit. And then what do they do? They have have to push a ton of money into government bonds in order to save the economy. That's a social role. So are you saying in the context of where we've come from, so put the, the trust example aside, but there's a wider issue there about the relationship about economics, government and the independent institutions as you've quite, quite rightly set out. Are you saying that in a renewed social contract, the bank is there to be quite sanitized in, in terms of setting fiscal monetary rates? Um, and then taking its cue from data across society rather than be pro-social in its setting of financial policy? I know it's a tough... Well, well it's, it's, again, it's a difficult question. We have a clear mandate, which is price stability, but then we're supposed to support European policies, and on the basis of Article 3, you have basically a very long list yeah. of issues. And the question is, can you do something on the basis of that list without doing politics? 
mm. and choose that's one and say, okay, quality. we do environment. And by the way, I don't think we've got the instruments, but that's another issue. But let's say, okay, we do environment, but we don't do energy security, we don't do defense. And if the mood within the public changes, now today much more attention to, the, to those two last ones, a bit, more, more, uh, a bit less of uh, environment recently, uh, should, should we move with the flow? Bank of England is different, because the Bank of England can receive a letter from the government telling them you should do this or go in that direction. In Europe, we don't have that. We have, you know, the treaty, the mandate, and that's it. So we, we interpret at our level what, what is our uh, understanding of the treaty. And I'm afraid even, you know, that beyond a certain threshold, you move from communicating that you care to uh, being part of the political debate. And, and that's a fine line, and I, I should think we, sh we should pay attention to that, yes. Mm. It's, yeah, absolutely. I suppose it's a different governing model in, you know, I suppose in the EU. And it's that question of politics, isn't it, at the end of the day. But um, those of you who m might have been there at the European at our um, round table in October, where we had Chris Peters, the Vice President of the European um, uh, Investment Bank, who stood here and said, it's really important that we start investing in green defence. And we should create the tools by which member states are able to purchase and build up the armament to defend ourselves in the future. A banker, a vice president, who talked about green defense. There are a lot of eyebrows that were raised in that, in that regard, uh, but a very different take on the issue. Not that I'm asking you to re respond to that, perhaps, uh, but you can if you want to. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm a central banker. I'm not a, bank, a banker, and uh, you know, I have a band-aid that is being defined in the treaty. So to that extent, it's qu quite different. Indeed. Ima, can I turn to you? Please. Um, first, if you could reflect on what you've heard from Pierre, um, and, you know, violently disagree if you wish to. It's okay. <laughs> um, but, Ima, it would be helpful to know, in the same thing, in the same question that I asked Pierre, uh, is that do you feel you have a role um, as a private sector, a global household name, right, um, to play a role in creating a better society. I mean, being a shareholder and co-producing a better society, given where we've just come out of and will continue to be in, um, do you think you have a role and how and what are your kind of reflections on what you've heard from Pierre? Yeah. I mean, I think because of what we've come out of, we absolutely have a role to play because we are, we're living in a time where it's not just one crisis that we're dealing with. You know, we, we're not just dealing with a pandemic or we're not just dealing with a climate crisis or just dealing with an energy or a cost of living crisis. We're dealing with a convergence of all of these crises at the same moment. And so it's absolutely a moment for us, you know, at a societal level, at a business level, at a governmental level, to question what is our role in addressing all of these crises. And I do think that we've seen, you know, a, a blurring or at least a better interaction between, you know, how we engage with on the, the positive outcome of what we can do here now, building back um, a, better, a better society. I think what's been very, very clear um, throughout all of these crises is that how important leadership is, how important strong leadership is at every level of society, um, how important it is that we are very committed and we have our strong convictions to doing what is right and what is better. And, you know, Pierre mentioned a lot about how we communicate, but it's, it really is about how we collaborate, how we work together. Um, you know, at, at, at a MasterCard level, we work very closely, you know, with central banks, we work very closely with other elements of government, whether state or federal government. Um, and I think it's so important that, you know, the more that we collaborate, the more that we work together towards a better outcome, it, it's just going to be, it's just going to be really key. I think here in Europe, we've been very um, impressed um, with, you know, the direction of travel that Europe has taken through managing these crises. Um, and I think, you know, from our perspective, we see that we have a really strong, uh, a really strong opportunity to to take a different role, and that's you know when you think about the big the big picture questions, whether it's you know the um, the digitalization of Europe and and the consumers here within Europe, whether you think about resiliency and protecting Europe, um, you know I'm talking about from cyber attacks and and, and digital attacks, whether you think about ESG, um, these are areas now that at a business level we are leaning into you know these topics to see, you know, what exactly can we do here? How can we support um, on these topics? And I think that that in and of itself is really important, 
Pierre, you mentioned that you know business has a role to play here, and that there's for some businesses there's green, a lot of greenwashing going on. And and let's not discount, let's let's not pretend that that doesn't exist because it absolutely does exist. Um, I think what's really important is that we take these crises and from a from a business perspective, we make them part of the DNA of the organisation. This is not a philanthropic effort. We are not doing this. We are not leaning into these topics um, to you know to do better. You know just for the sake of doing better. It's not just about philanthropy. It's about making good decisions that support your business. Um, the question of equality, the question of inclusive equality is critical. You know, consumers, you know, we're, we're part of a payments system. Consumers purchase men and women purchase and make purchasing decisions together, you know, making sure that we're serving all aspects of that economy, making sure that we're building back for the youth of tomorrow. I think all of that is just, it's just so critical. Um, and so I do truly believe that businesses have understood that they have a new role to play going forward. But our ask of, you know, policymakers and regulators, that's also clear. Um, you know, there has to be a, a level playing field. Um, there has to be a, a need to uh, to address, you know, some of those, some of the, when you're building back, when you're defining regulations, it's, it's important that you're thinking about the balance of the strict element of the regulation as well as the incentivizing that regulation and how you do both. Um, because in the end, businesses need to be incentivized to take on the risk to build back in a more sustainable way, in a more inclusive way, in a more positive way overall. So I think getting that balance right is really key. How do you respond to the challenge that Pierre I mean, I mentioned in his, in his remarks is that at the end of the day, your bottom line is money, right? So that's my interpretation of what he's saying. Okay, bottom line is money. So let's say that, you know, you, not must cover any private sector body, the bottom falls out right and therefore you're left with what and what 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 would you make of the values that we've been speaking about is it about how you respond to that situation which is the values that you you demonstrate or what i suppose the question here is that there's an interdependency between government and the private sector in europe and the world 70 yeah. percent of infrastructure ladies and gentlemen 70 percent of infrastructure is owned by the private sector so the government is actually a very small player when we come to a crisis so imagine there's a massive cyber attack and people can't get into the banking system or etc so you need to have some sort of relationship mm -hmm. for the two to come together um, so just respect re respond to that muddle of stuff i've just posed towards you yeah, I mean, there's no, again, I think there's no doubt that collaboration is, okay, let me take a step back. Uh, are businesses defined only by our bottom line? No. The answer is simply no. Um, today, across Europe, if I do not have a strong statement as to what I'm doing to support society, what I'm doing to support, you know, the environment, the economy, I can't hire staff, you know, I won't be able to get anyone to join my company. So there are some very practical things. Um, today, I think when we talk about, you know, how you positively engage your, you know, your, your staff or your, your economy uh, or your, your society, you have to be perceived to be beyond money. We have a saying within MasterCard, we say it's doing well by doing good. What we mean by that is doing well financially by doing good efforts for, for the economy and for society. We've been on a journey for a very long time now. We started more than 10 years ago with our former CEO, and he really defined what it is as a business to be bringing people into the, into the finance economy. So we, we were very much on financial inclusion journey. Um, as we lived through the, the pandemic, we became very focused on a digital inclusion, how we bring people digitally into the economy. We are very focused on gender and on the question of how we ensure that our both within our own within our own company but also more broadly that we're servicing the needs um, I think we you know we're really investing into um, how we support society again without with a fractured society business is not going to do well um, and without you know a planet that's failing neither business nor society is going to do well. So I think this realization of there are bigger, there are bigger goals than just pure profit, I, I, I truly believe that that's, that that's been understood and well understood by the business community and that we're all leaning into it in a very different way. So I hope that addresses is it so, your first. My final kind of question is, is it built into your governance regime? Uh, without question, yes. And that's important uh, across for people to the board. hear. Because you know, one of the things I remember in the UK when I was working there, it was like, 
to make a difference, you knew you had to be a part of the, the bottom line for a leader. So as chief exec, directors, you had to deliver on stuff. Mm -hmm. And that made a difference, because once you put it into their targets, things changed. Yeah. Is it the same for you? Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm laughing because we're at this time of year when we're setting our targets for next year, uh, which is a very complicated uh, endeavour, as I'm sure many of you are, are going through. And, and for us, often the challenge is when you look across the board, whether it's financial inclusion, digital inclusion, you know, uh, uh, um, environmental inclusion, we have many, many um, KPIs coming at us that we need to deliver. Partnership is key, I think, uh, in this. But all the way from our CEO down through all, through, for all of our employees, ESG targets are in place. Okay. I think it's really important um, that we consider how much um, you know, effort we can put on our value chain as well. So when we're thinking about our suppliers, when we're thinking about our customers, how much influence both soft and hard that we can actually apply on those to ensure that those partners are actually also engaged on this topic in a positive way. So the governance model is there. Again, it's important for businesses to ensure that this isn't about philanthropic, philanthropic efforts. It's important for businesses to build this in to their DNA, that it becomes part of the business model. Otherwise, we've seen it won't be successful. So that's really what we're trying to do. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm going to kind of bring it back to you. Now, you've all been listening. Um, and some of you have been taking notes, attentively kind of focus on it. Any questions? What's your reaction to what you've heard? Um, does it make sense? Do you disagree violently? Do you think it's all chutzpah? Is it, is it real? Um, here's your opportunity. Don't be shy. Can I invite you? As I caught your eye. Can we have the, a microphone here? <laughs> yes, so be wary of my eyes. <laughs> so if you catch me, that's it, you're done for. Uh, but no, you're from, the, you know, you're from the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability, right? Yes, that's right. I can't believe I knew that, but I, my eyesight's yeah. appalling. But there you go. Please introduce yourself and give us your reaction. Hi, yes, my name is uh, Sila I'm from the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership and fundamentally we work with businesses that are and have worked out they need to be part of the future, right? They need to consider what their purpose is, they need to align their values with that and move forward. I was quite interested by um, Pierre Wunsch's uh, comments about market failure because fundamentally we are living in a market failure. And if your role is to deal with that, then surely, I mean, climate is a massive example of where the market has failed fundamentally to deal with that. And if you want long-term security in society, then we'll need to massively deal with that issue and invest in that issue. And that is a question of risk, stability, all the shocks that might uh, affect society. So I think I would definitely see a bigger role than maybe you were hinting at from the bank's perspective. And broadly in terms of values, I also think the example chosen was particularly polarising example. I do think that there's a lot of different strands of thought happening at the moment. And I agree that if you are as a company, you want to have... Um, staff, you want to have customers, you want to have consumers. I mean, lots of businesses, they're looking throughout their value chain, they're talking, they're collaborating along their value chain, talking to their suppliers to see if they're reducing emissions, if, if they are signing up to anti-slavery regulations, all of the above, right? So this is happening and it's not going to change, I think. So it's more of a question about how we solidify and drive that particular angle. So... My thoughts, anyway. No, actually, but, but whilst you've got the mic, <clears throat> do you think the notion of a renewed social contract might be a, a good vehicle? Do you, and what would you want? So when you think ahead, you've got the parliament coming, new parliament and new commission. What do you think would be the, you know, the worm moment, you know, feeding the worm in the system or, you know, in terms of a regulation or an issue, what would you like to see change? I, any thoughts? Top of the head. Well, I'll just remember not to catch your eye next time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everyone's looking down. I'm looking at them. Everyone's like this. Um, well, I do think that, you know, we are in the poly crisis right yeah. now. Um, and I think that it's the only way for us to deal with it is to consider how all these efforts are distributed across society how we can bring people along, how we can implement the Green Deal, for example, in a way 
that really brings value and prosperity and as well as um, dealing with the environment, with nature, with our whole environment, broadly speaking. The redistribution and, is the kind of way of thinking about this, to a certain extent. Well, I wouldn't... It's more about how you bring everybody along with you okay. um, as, as you try and implement things. I mean, some of the Green Deal efforts will be huge. It will have massive impacts on people, whether you talk about buildings, roads, cars, all of the yeah. above, right? I yeah. Mean, Thank you. And, you know, there's wine and nibbles afterwards, okay? <laughs> but no, I don't need that. Justice is everyone's business. <laughs> you have that emblazoned, so I have to come to you to ask for a review. Yeah, sure. um, Andy, could I? Here? Just here? At the front. <clears throat> Introduce yourself and say, just reflect on the, <laughs> the debate. And similarly, if you want, what do you want out of this? Hi, so my name is Anya Verkamp. I'm the coordinator of a public mobilization campaign called Justice is Everybody's Business. Um, we're a representation on the European level towards the Corporate Sustainability and Due Diligence Directive. Nodding of heads. Some people are aware of what that is. Due diligence, yeah. Um, so, I mean, listening to you, um, there's a magnificent awakening that's happening within the private sector. Um, and don't get me wrong, I think that there may be many people that are waking up and realizing that things cannot continue the way that they are. But if it's so true that companies now want to have honest commitments to contributing to social welfare and to sustainable development, and that they know that their true resilience comes from contributing to solving the risks that they face, then how come political leaders are still making decisions that show that they believe that corporations will flee regulation, that they will go offshore, or that they will move around Europe uh, on the basis of where they're regulated or where they're not? Recently, the council came to its position on the due diligence directive, and France, at the last minute, um, blocked the position of the council on the basis of wanting to exclude obligations to the finance sector to uh, do due diligence on their, their downstream activities. So what are the um, human rights and environmental impacts of their investments? So for example, the banks that are financing a um, pipeline through a nature reserve in East Africa right now can can rest soundly, they only need to do due diligence on their staples and on their office coffee. And the reason that France did this is because they want to attract finance to Paris because of Brexit. They think that the finance sector will now move to Paris. So given that governments are still making decisions thinking that corporations think that way, then what's still the structural challenge? Like what is not reaching uh, to, to make this kind of shift where corporations continue to, to flee offshore and to flee regulations. But isn't it at the heart of what you're saying is there's a kind of a, a mismatch in mindset. You can see corporates moving in the right direction, but politicians are still behaving as if in the old mindset that actually, um, you know, we have to uh, be deferential because we want to have economic growth. The only way is to reduce red tape and therefore get them in. But we know of many, I mean, there are, you know, collections of CEOs globally who are doing the right thing. And we've just heard, you know, there are pe efforts being made and measurable efforts. But it's that, it's that mismatch that politicians, and we have a certain demographic of politicians making those decisions, by the way, uh, as you know, in the council. Is that the issue? Um, you, you tell me. I mean, okay. so, I mean, is it just a, a bunch of elite friends in Paris between the Ministry of Economy and, uh, you know, their, their banker friends that uh, aren't arriving at this enlightenment or...? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah okay. I, I mean, what would you uh, like? What would you like from the commission then? What would you know as as a as a, gr a body that's thinking about the central crises that we're going to experience? And actually, we're not going to have that old-fashioned view that oh, if we don't reduce red tape, we won't get finance because actually, climate and digitalisation is going to be whacking us in the face month I, on month. Yeah, actually, I, I don't want to ask anything of the commission because the commission's proposal for the due diligence directive was very good. Okay. What I would like to see is for business to say that they want binding regulation and that they won't flee offshore if there's binding okay. regulation. Okay, great. I want to complete the triangle, if I may. It's only the triangle in my mind. It's going that way. So can I come to you? Um, Mike, over here, please. <laughs> That's a very good citizenship of you. Thank you. Thank you very please much. Please do introduce yourself. Yes, um, my name is Bridget Cosgrave, and I'm here representing Sopra Steria. We are a large IT services business quoted on the Paris Stock Exchange. 
Um, Soposteria has been a very uh, long time engaged company on the ESG uh, agenda, and we're very proud of that. But at the same time, we do see in the current situation um, the war, the energy crisis, and cyber. And I thank Amir for commenting on the cyber. And I have to say, Mr. Munch, I am a bit disappointed with uh, the position as you have presented it for yourself as a, a central bank. Um, uh, you know, we have to see if you don't have the instruments, you have to be part of the solution to create the instruments. So, you know, if our, if our green bonds and the climate agenda, we don't find the financing instruments uh, available, there has to be a, a greater effort to do that. The other thing I think is missing from the dialogue it, so far, but maybe will come with Gerasimus, is the whole question of taxation. And of course, before we got into the war, the OECD working group on corporate uh, corporate tax and the, the better um, uh, levels of, uh, of payment of corporate tax and the closing of loopholes globally um, seems to have gone out of the discourse. And I'm quite surprised at that and hope that in the second half of the debate we can address that discussion. So just to just, just kind of, I'm not going to ask um, uh, Pierre to answer right now because I want to move the debate on, but I'll ask him to come back. What you're saying is central bankers, even though they're governed by a very clear set of treaties, uh, a very kind of, there's a, there's a sanitary coordinator about what you can do, what you can't do, and that actually if you get engaged in doing things like green bonds, you're skewing the marketplace. So therefore, uh, you're saying that actually that doesn't matter. You should still try and innovate and it doesn't matter if you skew the marketplace. No, I think you're asking, you know, what do we want to see in, yeah. in the future? And so if Article 3 does not allow uh, as important an institution as the NBB here mm. in Belgium, because mm. they're exceptionally well, well respected and very efficient mm. uh, central bank, if you're not able to engage on that part of the agenda, which is the green agenda, mm -hmm. the green deal, mm -hmm. then there's a problem with the definition of your rule. Mm -hmm. That would be my observation. I think I have two, two, two answers to that. Sure, because, okay. Uh, yeah. It's not that we are not engaging. Yeah. Uh, and I think there are a lot of things we can do in terms of, uh, we, we just hire a number of people to work on green finance, to work on a better understanding of the impact of the climate uh, challenge on the economy and so on. But I think there is a lot of misunderstanding about what the role of central bank is in the community. I mean, a lot of people think that central banks are about financing the economy. This is not the case. And actually, the problem is not a lack of finance. I mean, there is plenty of money. We've been more or less printing money for the last seven years. There is trillions of money. Mm. The problem is you need the right incentives for companies to invest in those. So, yeah, I think, I mean, some people dream that we are going to have a big green deal financed by the central bank. I'm sorry to say that it's a misunderstanding of how central banking works and how the economy is working. We today have an inflation problem. We are actually going to make losses on our QE billions of losses, um, and uh, we are not there to find the economy. Our mandate is price stability. But that we collectively have to work on climate, that we are not doing, to, not doing enough, that we need to do more in terms of taxes and regulation. You know, I've been pleading for a CO2 tax in Belgium, so it's not that I'm you know, not uh, concerned about the issue. I just believe it's not about the central bank printing money and financing the economy, because that's not the way it works. Great, thank you very much. And if I may abuse the privilege, 60 seconds. Yeah, two, two seconds. I think the other thing is the acceleration of the cycle. So, you know, recently we've seen two uh, initiatives at after a period of 11 years, the European Commission and the European Parliament has voted on a 40% participation in boards by women. This is an initiative I worked on personally in 2011 with Vivian Redding. It should not take us you know, 12 years to get this thing into. And we have lots of other examples. The cycle is just far too long. And actually, because of what we've gone through, would, one would assume that the cycle will reduce because we just don't have the time. Thank you. I'm going to move on so because we're running out of time and I and hope that most of you will kind of generate some questions and Ema and others can come back. But Jerusalem, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's a rare opportunity. You are the tax man of Europe if I can call you that. And, you know, we haven't hosted you for a long time. It's a real pleasure to have you here. Um, give us your views. You know, I kind of, uh, I, 
I have this fanciful notion that you know you can have behavioural taxation. You can ha use tax to create uh, uh, n um, you know normative behaviour. You can nudge the system because of who you tax, how you tax it, and the rate at which you tax. But over to you from your point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and congratulations to Friends of Europe for this uh, series of events. I think it is important to exchange, to enrich and to get input. I think uh, uh, when we look at the role of business, the partnership between business and government in change in behaviour is a long-standing one. And we have tools. I think there were people, let's say, in the previous century or in the 19th century, sort of industrialists who were building hospitals and social housing. So, uh, you know, there is, it's not a novelty that the private sector participates in, in government and societal change. I think what is important is uh, uh, what we are facing now is speed. There are some societal challenges, particularly the Green Deal that was, has been, mini, uh, 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 let's say, mentioned it, that we require a very speedy reaction, and therefore we need uh, 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 better coordination between the public and the private sector in aligning our incentives and our efforts towards a, a, a goals who it's normally uh, this change on behavior from the business and from the citizens and from the government would require more time. And I think this is a unique uh, challenge. Of course, it has happened, uh, you know, it happens at times of war. It's not the first time we have war, but I think the speed of aligning what we are doing has is a particular challenge. I think in Europe, we had traditionally, we have a lot of regulation. It's a lot of regulation that we have on environmental issues, on sustainability issues, on social issues. And uh, what I am saying to know our counterparts, for example, in, in economic policy in the US, we have this debate on carbon pricing. Mm. You know, and they say we don't need carbon pricing at federal level. And we say it's okay, everybody can choose its own instruments. We in Europe, we have tried to do with regulation alone it's not enough. It's just not, you can regulate people to death, but you know if you do not use additional incentives, market-based incentives, uh, who bring in the private sector in a different way, then you cannot achieve the results fast enough. And of course, they have come up finally with other instruments like IRA with uh, subsidies. And it's not that we don't give subsidies; we also give a lot of subsidies. But you need an alignment of incentives. Now, where do we stand in Europe? And taxation can certainly influence behavior. It can play its, its role. We have the Energy Taxation Directive that it is responsible for 10% of uh, all the effort that we will make to reduce CO2 emissions by 55% in 2030. We have the ETS reform, we have uh, renewable regulation, energy efficiency measures. We do a lot of policy things. And 10% of the result depends on our capacity to change energy. We have the proof that taxation can change behavior. Tobacco. 12 years ago, we had uh, increased the uh, you know, taxation of, uh, of cigarettes. Now it's, we are going to make new proposals again. But when we increased the, uh, uh, the, the, the taxation on, on cigarettes, compared to raw tobacco, we had more than 30% reduction in use of cigarettes and more than 30% increase in use of raw tobacco <laughs> that people... So uh, taxation can play a role. But, uh, and, and it can change behavior. And I think we have to identify as a society where do we put this <coughs> behavioral change. On the tax field, uh, you know, here in Europe we have we need revenue going forward, that's for sure, for all the, when we, it's, we need more revenue that we needed before the war and before the uh, energy crisis. So we, it's no question of reducing our revenue. I think we have at the moment about 50% of the government revenue Europe-wide is coming from uh, uh, income taxes. So the taxes on salaries plus social security contribution, everything that comes out of the, uh, income, personal income is about 50%. It has gone down by around 6% uh, in the last decade, but still quite sizable. We have 25% of the revenue overall is consumption taxes, uh, which is paid by everybody. 
we have about 10%, a bit more than 10% on corporate taxation, and we have the rest, uh, uh, let's say, energy and uh, um, uh, uh, tobacco, alcohol, these old behavioral taxes. Now, it is our view that the balance in this tax mix needs a bit to change in order to accelerate the change in behavior. Is not so. Uh, um, while mo many people see that uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, energy prices might be high or the packet of cigarettes is high. In effective terms, if you look at all behavior, all the green taxes, for example, or if you add them all together, the plastics, the energy, whatever taxes, all of them together, they are around 2.2 percent of European GDP for the last 10 years. So we have not increased the burden that it is linked to the environment. You know, this includes, I don't know, waste charges when you pay to your commune, all the charge, EU-wide, I'm not saying European taxes. So there is obviously um, an effort to be made in order to give the right signals uh, at all levels of government, sometimes it's local, sometimes it's national, sometimes it's European, in order to uh, affect, make people think about the water consumption, think about the waste, uh, and regulation alone is not enough, you know, to say, I regulate how much waste you can produce. We have to give you an incentive. The same goes for business, and I think it is important. I think uh, society also wants to see fairness. And the redistribution is one of the important pillars of the taxation system. I mean, it exists to collect revenue and redistribute somehow. So uh, people want to see fairness. It's important that, uh, you know, we have uh, in this effort, we have the private sector as a partner to this effort. I think uh, ESG policies uh, 10, 12 years ago, they have been very soft. Now they need to graduate and to be binding commitments. Eh? Yeah. It's not we had some greenwashing, everybody accepts. Uh, I think now they have to align and complement other policies, and they need to be more binding. Eh? <laughs> so uh, some be companies do better, some less well. And I think uh, the clients are the ones, and the, the clients, whether they're individuals, as citizens, for some business like yours or, or so, they have to be the judges of this of this, but obviously they have been a bit uh, too soft uh, in the past, and it was good because they engaged. Now it's the time to get real. And we need to fight uh, fraud as well. <coughs> I mean, there is uh, this, on taxation, we have this uh, punishing element, sort of, you know, of uh, getting people out of offshore centers or making people comply. We have a lot of uh, initiatives to be uh, able to avoid aggressive tax planning to make businesses more responsible in a more social and ethical way, uh, because uh, we can make a lot of efforts with the people in our jurisdiction, but if, uh, as it was said, if people flee our jurisdiction of the EU and go elsewhere, this is not fair. So I think we need, uh, we have a lot to do. Um, taxation is a auxiliary instrument. There, there is always sectoral regulation, I don't know, on health or energy, on climate, and this is the main driver, but I think we can complement in a substantive way in the changing of the behavior and to do it in a way that sort of also businesses understand. I think my experience is that uh, uh, we had recently a solidarity contribution, a levy for the fossil fuel industry for the, for as an exceptional profit. And no, no company came and say, we don't want to pay. So uh, in this crisis, the oil sector, which are the brown sector, which is usually not uh, very well considered, uh, you know, in the society, in this green discussion, but nevertheless, they all came. Now, they did try to influence some of the way of we do this calculation or so, but nobody came and say it is not fair that we do not contribute in this effort. And I think that's what we have to offer. We offer instruments. We have to be able also to design uh, initiatives that are uh, light in administrative cost. We need to uh, not to create, um, let's say, new ideas that require 10 year, let's say, infra new infrastructure for it to work. I think simplicity also, whether it is government regulation and government taxation, we have to hit where we have to hit, but I think we have to make sure that the business sector can 
follow quickly because speed, and I will close with that, it's very important. It's the speed of the change of the society that it's the new thing that we need to address now. Joshua, thank you. I thought you, know, you arrested our attention immediately when you set out the figures, you know, almost the pie chart of taxation in Europe, that you know, by far the bulk comes from income tax. Uh, and when you move across and you look at corporate taxes, 10%-ish, etc., you see an imbalance of social value if you regard taxation and its, its result and impact as a, as a reflection on that social value, then there's a bit of an imbalance potentially. My words, not yours. Um, you had a, a major uh, symposium last week about the future of taxation, right? Now, we as a think tank feel that taxation can play a much more of a, a pro-social role. Are we, are we very far away from that? When you think about, so, you know, you can talk about, uh, you know, uh, corporates fleeing, uh, and values in different parts, but in our very own backyard, when you look at the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Ireland, and they create havens, they create havens for the corporate sector to evade tax in various ways. So they're part of the, e the European Union. It becomes, and I know it's very controversial, people, I know it's controversial, but it have to be said, we're an independent think tank, uh, but, and we have to speak truth to power. But there is that dilemma there, isn't there, about c council members and their behavior, but forget, we know that's ever thus. But from someone, you're, you're, the, you know, you're the top man in taxation. Do you, from the symposium you had last week, where you had like 400 people attend about the future of tax, can you just share some of the thinking and the vision of what we might expect um, and what we might want to think about as we approach the new mandate of the European Commission? Yes, I mean, we did, we launched this uh, uh, series of annual events in which we are going to look at the uh, uh, future of the European tax mix. Uh, <laughs> Tax people are usually short term. You know, we look at next year's uh, uh, budget uh, deficit and how we tickle it. So we try to create a long term debate because, uh, precisely because the challenges are longer term. So and we are trying to get ideas on, on uh, how exactly, which are the behaviors that we need to influence. Not if behavior can be influenced, but what are the priorities in these behaviors. And I think that we got a, a wonderful participation, uh, 700 people all day, and uh, uh, you know a lot of ideas came up, and we need to work now on it going forward. I think there was an overall recognition that uh, there has to be more uh, F, uh, focus on behavioral taxes. I mean, after the war, the consumption taxes, they didn't exist before the war, more or less. So after the war, we had the uh, increase of consumption taxes. It is difficult to imagine that we will have an increase. Some people argue that the solution is to increase VAT another 10 points, and that's it. But I think the majority of the people consider that we need to complement the tools that we have with more behavioral taxes. Health, consumption, uh, uh, energy, green, and health are the two main areas where people focus. And uh, people... Uh, let's say, continue, the Commission also has the policy of trying to decrease the social security contribution and, uh, and, and let's say, uh, uh, tax that we have on income. Uh, it, the, it progress has been made, but we have always to keep in mind that we need government revenue. And as the IMF uh, speaker said on our tax symposium that, you know, you can only tax where you can measure and you can see. Huh? You cannot tax ideas. So, you know, the personal income is something that we do have, like the consumption is something that we have, and therefore we need to work around this in order to... Corporate taxation, uh, we have just agreed, it was mentioned to, uh, internationally to this OECD global tax deal mm -hmm. to increase corporate taxation to minimum 15%. Um, I think it had uh, created substantially little debate. Uh, people, uh, companies are not resisting this. Mm -hmm. uh, there are debates around the burden and how it will be done. And I think by now it's considered a very uh, sort of fair contribution. Uh, if anything, many people say this is not enough, we need to do more. But I think even uh, developing countries all over the world, you know, we have 136 countries that agree into that. So, but the corporate taxation uh, will not, we cannot focus only on corporate taxation. Sure. There is wealth, there is, uh, you know, the 1% more affluent citizens, which does not come through corporate taxation. Exactly. And uh, there is, of course, the behavioral taxes that we need. So we need to focus on different fronts. 
but I think uh, uh, also labor ta taxation will change with teleworking, with the mm -hmm. way people, the, the link of, uh, wh wh uh, if, I, if I may, what is the big change with this OECD tax deal? Everybody focuses on the 15%, but this, this is part of the story. The second big in, in, uh, change on the corporate taxation OECD deal is that you de-link the production from the taxation. Until now, we tax the companies. We say there is a factory here, we tax. There is a uh, software company here, we tax it. And this OECD tax deal, what does it say? We don't tax where the company is. We tax where the customers are in a certain way. We have a certain redistribution. The same happens with labor. Labor with mobile labor in the future, you know, people live in different countries, cross the border. So the notion, I, I tax, I take a part of your salary because your contract is in Belgium, then it will change. And this is, this is a continuous change. Nevertheless, I want to go back to my first point. Uh, okay, the trends on labor, the trends on how we tax, you know, we, we have time to adjust. I think there is a need of urgency on some important priorities we have to deal with green and some of these issues that have to do with labor mobility. So there will be, everything will be changing. I mean, this is the, the signal of our society, uh, the way that it works. But I think we need to get our priorities yeah. right. And this, we need consensus. We need consensus from the civil society. We need consensus from the business sector and we need uh, the signals that coming from us to align. I'll give you a last example. I had a meeting in COP27 with Madagascar. Okay, we have we are responsible for the carbon border adjustment mechanism. You know, we create uh, CO2 content. You know, for for uh, imports for Madagascar, aluminium production is very important part of their export. Mm. So they export to us now. We have a carbon border adjustment mechanism. At the same time, they need new investments, and therefore, from the IFIs, they get the similar signals. They need to green the energy going into the aluminium production. They get the signal from us. They get the signal from the IFIs who help them invest. We give them money as commission to invest in greening uh, their grid. So when you have complementarity of yeah. instruments, you can drive change, and change is welcome. Madagascar, despite is um, sorry, Mo Mo Mozambique. I, mm. I made uh, mm. I, Mozambique is one of the countries that try now to become. Uh, they have a, a huge hydropower, a huge renewable energy potential, and they get similar signals from different policy areas, okay. and therefore they are moving. That is what uh, we need to get right in our societies. You know that what the citizens believe, what the companies believe, what the government can do to align and have faster change. Thank you, Gus. Excellent, excellent contribution. And you know, you, that model is potentially kind of harvestable for other areas, obviously. But the key to that is the interdependency. Uh, that we often lose sight of, that you either tax and move, or you realize that you need to create a, an ecology of change, and what you demonstrated there is that. It would be great to come back to you, not now, uh, about what, your, what you think the priorities should be in tax policy, but we'll do that in the concluding part. I'm going to take an extra few minutes or so of your time, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't mind, because I'm running over, but this is too rich a debate, uh, and I'm definitely not going to end the debate without having Jane make a contribution. Laura, uh, Laura sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> There. How badly could you tee that one up, right? You forgive me in advance. <laughs> the delightful Laura. No, so please do reflect on what you've heard so far. Um, you might just want to explain to people what We Move Europe does, yep. so we get a sense of the context you're coming from. Great, thank you. thank you. So We Move Europe is a community of about a million people scattered across the European Union um, who really care about... Uh, the survival of the European project and in particular care about issues, anything from climate change to the welfare of people on the move to tax justice, etc. And actually, before I tell you more about that, quick poll to see if you're still awake. How many of you, please raise your hands, either have children or nieces and nephews in your lives? Okay. Um, how many of you are worried about the state of the planet that we might be leaving behind to those children? How many of you are worried about the state of inequality and stability in the world that we're leaving behind for those kids? Right, good number. 
Okay, fair, fair enough, populist questions, but that is something that we are really bloody so worried about. Who is not. Yeah. Well, who is not indeed, who is not? But it's to, it's to make this debate a little bit more human and a bit more down to earth, because I think if we had some of those children in the room today, and maybe just think about some of those kids you're thinking about, if they were in the room and they heard you, Gerasmus, mention that balance of taxes, the 50% from income, the 25% from consumption, and the 10% from corporate tax, I think they'd ask the question, why? And I think they'd be right to ask that. And sometimes we are so structured into the thinking of an economic system that was set up in the 1970s and we can't think beyond it. But that has to radically change. And from the perspective of corporate social responsibility, I've been in this town for 21 years. I rocked up here as a nervous commission stagiaire in 2001 um, and quickly went to work in the European Parliament where on the Environment and Development Committees, my boss, uh, an MEP, um, was sent a whole lot of very glossy brochures from companies that said things like, we are building schools in southern India to contribute something back to society. And the problem was that not necessarily those specific corporations, but many corporations were being mentioned in the same development committee as those who were polluting the local water base, grabbing land and not providing decent jobs because they were bringing their own employees with them from Europe. So when I spoke to my colleagues in my previous job at ActionAid International, where I worked for 10 years and was the, the campaign's lead here, what do you want from Europe? What they tended to answer was, sort out your corporations, because it's all very well that you have a nice initiative um, buying classrooms here and there, but until you stop going against and watering down regulation and actually turn over and support regulation that moves in a progressive direction, we don't want to hear it. And I think that that's something we really have to take into account. I just want to give you one story, an example from last Thursday that I found really hard to take after 21 years in Brussels. I met a certain commissioner, no names will be provided. Um, and it was about the issue of amending a regulation in order to end the expert export of specific pesticides to the global south. Now those pesticides have been banned in Europe because they are bad for health and they are bad for the environment. But we continue to export them to countries like Brazil and many countries in Africa. I wonder if they go to Mozambique. Um, and the commissioner said to us, we said, look, surely this is a no-brainer, surely this just stops, right? And the commissioner said, no, because the chemical industry is in trouble financially since the crisis and there's jobs and if I shout about this inside the College of Commissioners, what my college will tell me is you're trying to destroy European industry and European jobs. Now in reality, I don't know if any of you are chem chemical industry experts, but the chemical industry is not doing too bad at all. There are massive reserves. Uh, the number of jobs they're talking about that are producing the particular kinds of pesticides they're talking about are minuscule. And it is bizarre to me to think that the chemical industry could not shift some jobs over towards the production of the kinds of chemicals that are not uh, creating deformities in kids elsewhere in the world. So. This for me versus Europe consistently talking about a Europe of values, we don't get to do the two things at the same time, right? Like you can say, and this is another thing that I heard in that meeting, well, if we don't do it, other regions in the world will do this. And this is what I've been hearing for 21 years. And I know what my colleagues in the Global South would say, what kind of an argument is that? How can you stand up and say you're a Europe of values and at the same time say, well, if we don't export poisonous pesticides to the Global South, others will do it. I do not get it fundamentally. So I want to finish on a note of support, which is what would I do if I had any uh, sort of role inside the corporate sector? Um, what are the do's and don'ts? What are the stops and starts? I would say, one is, you know, stop lobbying for a few jobs in sectors where people's lives are at stake. Um, on, on a Belgian level, I was very interested to see last week um, the note from Politico that said that uh, Alexandre de Croo had been in favour of the, uh, the push to um, try to, to get patents for vaccines to be suspended temporarily during um, the pandemic. Uh, the Belgian government was in favour of that, but there had been a call from Johnson & Johnson to the De Croo cabinet, which basically meant that uh, essentially they said that they would reconsider their investment in Belgium. So 
Recommendation number two, stop threatening to pull out your jobs and investment uh, based on the position of your government because that's probably the worst thing you can do and if you want a good reputation as a corporation, I really don't know what you're doing. Um, the third one is, and particularly for the financial sector, I would say, divest in fossil fuels, right? So follow the green taxonomy put in place by the EU, but not when it comes to gas and nuclear. So gas is a fossil fuel, right? No matter how good a lobby job the so-called natural gas uh, lobby has done, it is a fossil fuel, and that's something you pass on to those kids we were talking about a moment ago. Nuclear is not a fossil fuel, but it is, uh, there are three sort of three strikes you're out problems with nuclear. One is that you pass the waste problem, the very significant nuclear waste problem onto those kids. The second is it's way too expensive vis-a-vis -vis the, the alternatives. And the third is simply that we don't have time to put in place that infrastructure. So these are very sort of uh, realpolitik kind of responses. But in all of this, uh, the banking sector still is supporting um, uh, fossil fuels, and we know that the Belgian bank had a lawsuit against it from Client Earth, which it has now withdrawn, um, because there seems to have been some progress on the side of not investing anymore in fossil fuels. I would love to hear that that is the case. Um, last two things is, is taxes. I mean, pay your fair share, right? Where is, what is this 10%? What would the kids say to that? And what should we say to that, really? I'm just dying for one corporate actor to break the line and say, actually, we earn too much money and we want to increase that, but properly. Um, and I'm also dying for one corporate to break ranks and say there should be a maximum income for CEOs and shareholders as well as a minimum income for workers. And the very last thing is that when I speak to the people who are part of the We Move community of one million people who really care that the European Union con continues to exist, there's so much cynicism and there's so much Euroscepticism that is driven by a perception of complete corporate capture of Brussels. Some years ago, Transparency International did a report that showed that 75% of the Commission's top meetings, top commissioners meetings, is with transnational corporations. I'd love to see the updated report, but I doubt that it has changed much since it was written. So it's not about corporates not having a, a role at the negotiating table, it's that you're taking over all the space. And that is something that just like when the bailout in 2008 created an awful lot of that polarization we're talking about since then, the same thing is happening in terms of a perception of complete corporate capture that is driving skepticism and distrust of citizens, the people who make up We Move, are the kind of people who probably could be convinced to go out and vote in 2024. But they keep telling us, you know, do we really have power? Do we really have a say? And I keep telling them, yes, we're working on it. But I would love if corporates worked with us to, to really shift that power, because that's the stuff that matters, not the nice stuff with a few citizens here and there. Thank you, <laughs> Laura. Uh, that, can I just add that, you know, in the equation when you describe the relationship so palpably between commissioner and private sector, it doesn't seem like it's just the corporates that need to change, it's our commissioners also need to have a bit more gumption and speak to their values, surely, also. Probably, but I feel for him. <laughs> I really do, right? I think he's talking the truth that he doesn't have support inside the College of Commissioners and that the College of Commissioners has shifted back towards more of a logic of growth and competitivity. But, no, no, if I can challenge you back, you said you, if you just have one corporate act to break the, break the mould and say, actually, I'll pay more. Mm. We need a commissioner with leadership, That's do true. we not, to say the same thing. So it's, it's both. It's not just corporate, it's also commissioners uh, to actually say, ah, no, I'm not in this for this. Mm -hmm. And I can change it. Mm -hmm. So it's the same kind of thing. Um, you can't underestimate the fact that we have brought you a wide perspective, I hope, in this debate. That was our intention to bring, you know, corporate, central bank, um, um, uh, private sector, and uh, the, the fire and, you know, the reflection of, you know, the mirror uh, being held up to us from civil society in various ways. Before I wrap up the debate, because I do want to give an opportunity for people to ask questions or reflect before all of you, I would ask just to kind of make a reference to some closing remarks on what you've heard so far. Um, but in those closing remarks, I think let's not try and continue to deconstruct the problem. I'd be really appreciative if you could say this is the one thing we should do. So Gerasmus, if I, you know, if I say to you, what would be the priorities do you think for tax policy uh, for the new, for the new ma mandate, if you're able to, for example, um, you know, et cetera and so forth. So that's what, that's what I'm looking for. But before I do, any questions? from people here in the room. 
You're all going to look away from me. I can see that. None of you, none of you are meeting my eye at all. <laughs> Literally looking down. Okay. All right. Ah, yes, of course. Why did I not look at you? Of course. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, my mother is a teacher, so I'm very good at making eye contact but not getting called on. I know the tricks. Um, my question is... Please introduce it. Oh, yes. Yeah, I know you, but obviously the people yes. don't. Apologies. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Garcia, so I'm, I'm here with Young Professionals in Foreign Policy, but uh, I am also uh, a, a consultant. I do public affairs with Instinctive Partners, so I have this strange, dual-hatted role of thinking of the next generation, but also, you know, I have my clients from a broad range of backgrounds, so have to wear multiple hats and, and try and think broadly. Um, it is a rather broad question, with lessons not necessarily from, from here, but from the animal kingdom. Um, and also from sort of history. We know that companies have been able to run financial deficits or operate at a loss to increase market share or to fuel growth. Um, is it not possible for companies to likewise run a moral deficit and operate morally at a loss? Uh, the joke is, right, you don't have to outrun the bear, you have to outrun the slowest person. So is there not a, a hole in the system whereby if you could just get away with being a bad stakeholder, a bad shareholder for five years, um, do you bring down the efforts of those who are trying to um, do well by doing good uh, and just eke out, just cut a corner and then slip in, cut the line right at the end and say you've reformed your ways. So I guess the question comes down to how do you deal with uh, the people who would take advantage of the vanguard trying to do the right thing um, by feeling like they still have runway? Mm -hmm. But it is just my same challenge as I said to, to, uh, to Laura, it's, it's not just the corporate world, is it? It's our political leaders who are part of the, they play the same game and they play the same dance, but we seem to be letting them off. Is, this, is that more a sign of our sense of cynicism, of the lack of political change, and we think we can get more change from the private sector because, because of the money game? Just your views on that. Yeah, I think, well, I certainly have a cynical streak. Um, and I'm sure that the recent Edelman Trust Barometer would also agree that they have seemingly more faith in um, private yeah. actors than in, in political actors. Um, but I think you just have to put the money where the mouth is. And um, yeah, politicians tend to think in election cycles. And that's not always how things work. The calculus is rather different. I think that the regulator's role and the politician's role is to both work in different ways to uphold that social contract. You have to get things, but you have to give things. And everyone has both obligations and benefits, but accountability. And all I would say is, um, if I know people, the right thing should always be the path of least resistance. And if it's not, people and corporations and politicians may not take it. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Gentlemen there, thank you. Please do introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Costa Cervenes from Net Company Intrasoft, uh, also an IT company. I'm going to try to talk. I have a problem with uh, a cold, but uh, you know, one thing that I, I've heard excellent viewpoints on everything, but uh, what we're discussing has been looked at by futurists over the last 30 years. We're, we're talking about a, a unified society versus an, an anarcho-capitalistic one, and you know, we've all seen the movies and all things. Um, I've heard everything from regulation to taxation incentives, you know, and all these things, uh, and, and of course the, 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 the social outlook. What I haven't heard about is the judicial repercussions that can be used. So um, we have the example of tobacco in which a tort, so a commercial legislation, what if a similar policy to what's been done, uh, I don't know, that Bill Gates passed for uh, IP and software, where the intentional theft you know, is criminal? What if commercial repercussions were that happened with the knowledge of commercial directors or, or, or corporate uh, boards and so forth were criminalized? So I know that I'm selling this chemical, this pesticide to X company, and people are going to die from it. If I know about it internationally, I should be subject to criminal prosecution the same way that I would if, you know, I intentionally hit somebody with my car and drove off. Just food for thought. Indeed. But again, I would say to you that what are the, what, what are the checks and balances we put on the public sector, at those who are involved in deciding how society is governed? You want to have a last shot, but short, because I want to go back to our panel. Um, just here at the front. 
I wanted to thank you especially for that comment that was really, um, yeah, really, really lucid because one of the possibilities with the corporate sustainability due diligence directive was that board members of corporations could be held civilly liable for the human rights abuses and the environmental impacts throughout the value chains of those corporations. Civilly liable. And when somebody from the Business Europe uh, lobby was speaking at a debate in the European Parliament about this, he said, but then we'll never find any board members. <laughs> no, but, but I mean, I'm sorry, but I mean, if there's some awakening happening in the corporate world and you wouldn't want to be a board member if you can be held liable for horrible things that are happening in your value chains, then there's, a, there's, a, there's an incoherence happening. Indeed. So this is not a, simply about... One, a, one point, one, if very I, briefly. Or ve two seconds. Anybody can be held civilly liable. You're talking about criminally liable. Yeah, that's that's, a, that's a different story. So anybody can sue anybody else because they wear the wrong shirt or they don't like their shoes or whatever. That's a civil lawsuit. You're talking about a criminal where they actually go to jail for yeah. doing it. Okay, let's move on. Let's move this forward because this, you know, I want us to think about what, what can be done, what's possible, what's the uh, um, opportunity out there for us to find ourselves in the time that we do to nudge behavior in the right direction. It shouldn't be a corporate bashing versus public sector bashing or the fact that you know, citizens feel that they are uh, left behind. Given where we find ourselves, we don't have the luxury, A, of time, or thinking that we can just rely on what we've learned so far in the past 70 years. The past three and a half years have shown us that. So we need to all rethink our, I suppose, our received wisdom about positive social change. But I want to start, Laura, I'm going to start with you, right? Because you made a very powerful statement. But my challenge to you is, what would you like to see happen, right? And, and again, I say to you, Think about accountability, public accountability of commissioners, as much as you think about corporate accountability. I can, and this is a debate about the role of the private sector. No, indeed, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's, it's intertwined. I, it is. So what I would, to answer your question, it's a really good one. What I would say is, for as long as in the social contract we currently have, most of the meetings that the commissioners have are with business, I'm not surprised that they are swayed in a certain way. So something structural, structural needs to change in how the actual lobby setup is happening in Europe. That's number one. Number two is the redistribution issue and the one you were talking about, which I really agree with your point about we need to rebalance that tax situation because we keep saying, yes, of course it's about growth and redistribution, but we've got all these indicators indicators for growth and nearly no indicators for redistribution. So if they're not there, we're not going to do it. I think the third thing is the due diligence point, which is that that would bring an awful lot of accountability. And finally, invest in the new system because it's already there. For 10 years more and more, we've been talking about investing in renewables in a, in a mass way, but it hadn't been happening. Now with the shock to the system, it is happening. And yet it's a pity we didn't get it right 10 years ago. So there's so many other glimmers of hope like that, renewables as an opportunity for an entirely new system, like, take them up. Excellent, thank you. Grasmus, if I can come to you. Again, I want you to touch upon what you think the priorities should be as we, move, as we look ahead. Because, you know, you talked uh, eloquently about the pie, the tax pie in, in Europe, and what some of the issues are and what we've always seen and others have, have achieved. But rather than a them and us, are there ways in which tax could be used as an incentive, so through tax breaks for the citizen that can actually achieve greater skills and outcomes for the corporate that has, let's say, social clauses built in to create better housing or a better environment, which has been tested out? Is, I mean, I'm, that's my words, me feeding you, but what would be your priorities in the, you know, in the next 24 months that we should set? Yeah, I think that... Uh Behavior. We talked a lot uh, about uh, tax and, uh, uh, and and revenue, but I think uh, when we look at uh, the society, they also care about the spending side of the government. So we have to be able to balance well the revenue side with the spending side. Uh, citizens and companies. All surveys shows that you know company investment decisions are not anymore driven by tax factors. There driven by environmental factors. What is the infrastructure that is offered? What is the education, the well-being of the citizens? So I think we need to avoid looking at issues in isolation. Uh, companies mm -hmm. going to tax havens, it was mostly uh, a, a thing of the past, and now they are influenced by other factors. That's the first thing. We need to have a consistency between revenues and spending. 
The second is, uh, I think we need to bring in Europe specifically, we have uh, a big deficit in transparency. Whether we look at energy, whether it's a corporate taxation, whether we need, there are millions of exceptions. Uh, if you look at our energy uh, taxation directive proposal and or our documentation, you will see we have a minimum tax here in one country make an exception there, another makes there. So between, I don't know, Belgian farmers and uh, Dutch farmers, there is a completely different tax environment, not on the law, but on the exceptions. We need simplicity, we need more internal market, we think we need a certain more common approach across Europe, because otherwise we have a lot of distortions and lack of transparency. We simply do not know, uh, you know, how much everybody pays. And I think we need to simplify the corporate tax environment and increase the taxation uh, in line with the OECD tax deal. I think this is an acceptable target and I think this is an achievable target. But this will not solve all our issues. We cannot tax our way out our future, you know, only by looking at corporates. I also want to give, uh, uh, there is a lot to be done on corporates, but I want to give some good examples, mm. you know, and this, I need, and we need the engagement of the private sector. Mm. A major pension fund, ABP, they divested all of their uh, shares in one major oil company, uh, which was very difficult for them and their board because after 10 years trying to get there as a board to get uh, a proper uh, ESG strategy, they failed, so they decided to divest completely. So who is the private sector? Mm. These are the companies, but there are also our pension funds where your pension money is interested. There are different actors and we need to get them all to act in the same way. I would, uh, uh, I don't have time now to address in detail. I think there is this punitive aspect. Let's put people in prison, you know, criminalize, etc. This is necessary, but it cannot be, in a society like Europe, it cannot be the major force of change that we put everybody in prison. You know, I think uh, we need to have positive elements. We need to have positive engagement, positive signals, uh, and al alignments of, of issues. So we need to work with both. Uh, aspects, and I think it is possible. So, uh, you know, from our side on the Commission, we plan a major corporate taxation reform that will simplify and give transparency for people. I think we need to focus on behavioral taxes that mm. will uh, help us to move out of fossil fuels and a greener future and spending. I think this is important, and I believe that we need to look more on the health aspects because they will also drive our society health, but they will also eventually uh, uh, have to do with our sustainability policy. After 2040, you will have to eat very little meat, otherwise the environment and the emissions, you know, will go up. But, so enjoy your steak today, but, uh, you know, we need to see what we do uh, with uh, health and taxation in the future. Now, unemployment and the uh, income taxes, the labor related, uh, they will go down, but we do have a society in Europe that requires a, a level of uh, uh, public hospitals, public uh, schools, and so it's an illusion also to think that there will be always less and less taxes to pay. Taxes have to be paid, but the money has to be well spent, and in many societies, they value this uh, uh, role of the government. Thank you very much. Actually, I'm not going next to you. I'm going to go to Pierre, actually, um, and, and then end with Ima, because uh, I think that creates a nice balance uh, of, of, you know, who starts and who ends, if you like, in gender terms. But, you know, there's been a lot, and I can see, I can see you've been reflecting on the various bits of debate. Uh, what's your reaction to what you've heard? And actually, but just looking ahead. I'm a bit tempted to do like Nora, uh, because okay. we all agree we care about our children, uh, nieces, and so on, and care about the planet. Mm. Who would want to have oil prices back you know, at 300 euro within three years and gas prices back at 300 euros per megawatt hour? Who would want that in the next three years? Well, that's what you are going to get if you stop financing gas and oil. So why am I saying this? We, we live in a world where you have what is legal, what is authorized, what is undoubtedly good. And then you have a huge gray zone in between the two. And people have very different opinions about what one should do or not do among you know, what is legal. And I think there is a lot of misperception and, and sometimes lack of realism and maybe lack of sincerity 
on what can be achieved. So in many, many uh, places here in Brussels, if you say that uh, you are against financing of oil and gas today, you are on the right side of history. It's the right thing to do, and you believe a lot of firms should stop financing gas and oil today. Well, the bad part of the story, if you stop financing oil and gas today, you are going to have gas prices back at 300 euro per megawatt hour, and you are going to see all governments going uh, in, in the Middle East, um, bending to uh, some people, they might even go back to Russia, they will go to Venezuela, they will go to Iran, because stopping financing oil and gas today is just a bad idea. But a lot of people believe this is a great idea and we should force companies. So there is a lot of mis misunderstanding on these issues. And then, of course, people then get cynical because they believe that being, you know, caring about values is doing all these lists of things that look so nice on paper, but which are complex issues. And I've read the report of the International uh, Energy Agency. What they say is not that we should stop financing gas and oil today. They actually uh, say exactly the contrary. What they say is that there are enough reserves, proven reserves of oil and gas. But that's very different, very different, because to get the, or the proven reserve out of the, the soil, you need investment. And actually, I've been uh, at a meeting uh, with specialists in the energy sector recently at the ECB, their take is that because we have underinvested under in uh, uh, fossil fuels in the last years, that we need to increase investment in fossil fuels in the next few years to avoid prices uh, cl uh, climbing, to increase by 25%. I'm for a CO2 tax. I believe we should you know, really make sure that the price of oil and gas goes up so that we don't use it by 2050. But, but I see here around the table, I mean, we, 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 we seem to agree and then we don't agree because we, uh, we have a very different view on some of those issues and then we might very quickly become very cynical because the firms that have said that they wanted to, you know, they had values and they cared about the climate, they invest in oil and gas till today while this is not acceptable. Well, my take on it, if they would stop today, we have a big, big problem. Uh, you know, it's going to take time. And so, I mean, I, I was just taking that example because, mm. you know, and again, we can take one-liners and, and, and ask the public and, and then at some point we have, and, and, and no offense, but, that, that we agree, but it, those issues are complicated. And I'm, a bit, I'm, I'm very concerned that uh, we put into public debate and on the shoulders of companies yeah. a lot of uh, societal debates that are extremely complex and at the end of the day should be the responsibility of elected bodies. Because if it's true that it's a bad idea to invest today in exploration of oil and gas, it should be forbidden, that's it, you know. We have a democratic debate, yeah. we vote, and if you believe it's a good idea, we stop, it's forbidden. I don't spend, want to spend a lot of time, you know, seeing company per company, whether they do it a little or not, no. If it's a good idea to stop, then we stop and we forbid. So I'm really concerned that we have this huge gray zone where uh, CEOs and companies and everybody, I mean, as, as the head of a company or as a board member, you're supposed to have an opinion on so many things and the rights and wrongs on so many things, it's, it's really becoming a very tough job. I'm sorry, but oil is already in the rules. It's not in the green taxonomy. Yeah, but I, I, I'm, I'm just saying it might, it might be not in the taxonomy, but we have 30 years, and stopping investment in oil and gas today is going to lead to an explosion of oil prices in, in the coming years. That's but it. it. But what you're saying is actually investing in a transition, surely, is that the point you're making, that we need to move? Uh, I'm saying stopping investment in oil and gas today, mm -hmm. today, it's a bad idea. Okay. Just, just I want to, I think you asked the wrong question, Pierre, if I may. You said, would you like to see the, the prices to go up? If you had asked, should prices go up, you would get a different answer, I think. But uh, I, I say to my children, uh, you know, I say to them, you should be against everything that I like to do. 
<laughs> so I like to drive fast cars. I speed up in this and that. They should be against me. You know, that's their future. They have to make me to fine every day. Like uh, I have, I don't like driving 30 kilometers in the Brussels, but they should insist that it doesn't go away because I am dangerous. You know. But the issue, the issue is today because I'm for oil prices and 300 euro in 2050 or even more because we should not use oil anymore. But that's very different. And I'm, I'm for a CO2 price that makes it sure that we don't consume oil and gas in 2050. But if you have supply destruction today, before demand destruction, you're going to have a revolution, people, in the street. It's just not going to work. And, and if, if we cannot have those debates in an informed manner, it's not going to work. Yeah. Put in place, such as the windfall tax that came to nothing, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. There's also the decoupling of uh, gas and uh, electricity markets. If we wanted to get a bit more system, it's not as simple we're as what you're saying. We're going to agree on some of those and disagree on others. We, do, we don't have time for it, I see. But it's more, it's not that simple. I'm letting that fly because this is a good. This is the point of debate, isn't it? Isn't it the point of debate to have conflicting views so that we might reach a point? We might reach a point of solution. Because if we just did it through a bubble, uh, we're not going to make any progress. And this has been heartening that there are such diverging views. But this is exactly what Europe should be about. But we don't have very much of it. So I'm really pleased you made the point you did. Because I think there's below that, if we had more time, you could actually explain your theory behind that, which sounds harsh. Uh, but um, we don't believe you're a bad man. You're a good man. <laughs> you're a good man. And so, but you know, but that's what we. That's the that's the glory of this. Imam, I'm going to ask you. It's a difficult debate that you know we've been in, but a good one, I hope. And I'm, I'm not asking you to sum it up. I just want, excuse me, colleagues, call it shh. Respect for our speakers, please. Um, Imam, reflect on what you've heard in a similar way. You've you know. I mean, I'm struck by the fact that when you talked about that it's ESG is hardwired into your governance. My view is there should be governance in a similar perspective in relation to the public sector. There should be greater data, you know, uh, freedom of information, data transparency, etc., and governance of the Commission, if you like, in terms of some of these points. But that's a separate matter. But it matters because you're the ones who have to engage with these players. From this whole point that we're saying about the private sector as a shareholder uh, in a renewed social contract, set out your reflections on what, um, in terms of what you've heard so far and where you see this going. I, that, and that's a tough one. So, I mean, it's been a fantastic debate and definitely with very varied viewpoints put across, but that's the point of a debate, but that's the point of a society as well. There are many different shareholders we are all shareholders here we are not stakeholders in europe we are we are active participants and we have a voice and we have opinions that we want to express and 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 that's tremendously important um but you know public private partnership is critical if we want to change anything. It is not singularly the role of, of the government. It is not singularly the role of society. It's the role of business as well to lean in to this very difficult debate. And I think, you know, we need to do that respectfully and we need to do that with speed because I do think the we are at a moment where with this convergence of crises, you know, it, it's so important that we, we participate now and, and actually affect change. I'm not representing the chemicals industry. And I'm sure if they had a representative here, they would represent themselves differently. I'm representing a payments business. And when, Gerasimus, when you talk about spending, you know, that's the business that we enable. We enable people to spend safely, um, confidently, securely, and to do that in a digital fashion. And what, so what I can reflect on is how MasterCard leans into these debates. You know, we have a, an ability to educate consumers. When you are spending, are you spending in a way that is environmentally supportive? Are you spending in a way that creates a conscious consumer? Providing that education and a means to change your, your way, should you choose to do so, I think that's really critical. So businesses, at least in my opinion, should reflect on the business that they provide and, and think about these, you know, these ESG topics from how can I drive it through the purposes of my business and do it in a way that, that looks to the greater good because I really think that that's really important. And I do see that businesses are. I do see that businesses are leaning in and, and having this positive um, uh, way here. Businesses have a secondary aspect in that we have a balance sheet. 
like government, although smaller, but we have a significant balance sheet and that allows us to be creative. Um, it allows us to look across the society and, and, and consider, can I invest in those that are being underserved? Can I support um, you know, those that are well served? I mean, certainly from my perspective, and hand, sorry, and the third point is, how do I support the youth and the future? Um, so the underserved, you know, ensuring that we have a robust middle class and how do I look to the future? Again, we support consumers, we support businesses particularly with this agenda. How do we ensure that they are that they are supported digitally? How do we ensure that they are supported from any cyber attacks? So doing it with the lens of the business that you come from um, and the, the area that you come from I think is really important. And finally, um, you know, again, I personally don't want the environment to be a collateral damage of the crisis that we're going through. And I don't, my business does not want the environment to be a crisis. We cannot, we do not have a future. Our children, we do not have a future if we do not have a planet. So taking, considering the topics, again, from the lens of the business that you come from and leaning, you know, doing more on those topics is really critical. We are doing, we are trying to do more when it comes to the environment. We are trying to do more when it comes to supporting equality and supporting societies. Mm -hmm. It is a journey, but we're in it together. And so my, my final message is we need to, we need to co-create the future that, we're, that we want to have together. We need to work together. It, it cannot be regulated. It cannot be top down. It needs to be this coalition of voices that sit at a table and discuss these very complex matters in a way that ensures that we are on a, on a positive trajectory uh, and a positive momentum for change. But it is about working together to do that. You must thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all, but thank what a fabulous panel and conversation. <laughs> And so imagine that was just the start of a three-part series, so hang in there, right? Come for the next one. Uh, but what I'm saying to you is that, look, from our point of perspective, uh, as a think tank, we're really clear that the rules governing society as we know it over the past 80 years are just not going to work in the next 80, uh, especially in the next five. What we do know is if we use foresight, we're going to witness multiple sequential parallel crises, digital or uh, climate related and what we just think about one moment what I said about 70% of infrastructure being owned by the private sector and imagine mass flooding in this in the heart and the central part of Europe what's going to happen so how do you use foresight better to ensure that we can work together as a coalition to not be rabbit in front of headlights but have a more foresight future foresight based future so that we can have a different conversation about roles responsibilities and expectations and the point you make really well the people that are not in this room are that generation who are growing up using this and have only done this so the generation growing up that we don't understand, they're going to be very different in terms of their social skills, their cognitive skills, and actually that's the legacy, that's, you know, we are creating a legacy for that generation. What we need to be thinking about is, and the point I think you made before as well, Pierre, a lot of young people at the moment don't feel meaning or purpose in their lives, either through employment or social connections. And I think what we need to think about, not just the here and now, but that generation that's growing up digitally, but with a very different sense of social mores. Thank you all very much. Thank you for joining us. Please stay for lots of lovely cocktails and nibbles. They're all vegetarian, by the way, because we've gone green in that respect. So whilst there's alcohol, there's lots of vegetarian nibbles. Thank you all very much. Take care and thank you all for being here. Take care.
to the place I work. Try to sue. 